All right, sir. Once again, good morning po. I am Chelsea Lontok and together with me are my groupmates, Samantha Asuncion and Claudia Francisco. We are from the International Studies Department of San Beda College, Alabang. All three of us majoring in Philippine government and external relations po. Today we have okay. Professor Nestor Castro. So through researching possible informants po, we figured that you, sir, would have sufficient knowledge on the field field of our study, Assessing Development Aggression in the Philippines, the Cases of Kaliwa Dam and Chico River Pump Irrigation Projects, especially po with your expertise on indigenous people's issues and your credentials, po, of course, having done field research in indigenous communities and also a dissertation on the Kalingil IP, which is also one of the tribes majorly affected by the Chico River Pump Irrigation Project. Sir, once again, thank you very much for making the time to speak with us, Po. Before we start with the questions, Po, we would like to ask, Po, if there is anything that you would like to say. Um, Nothing really. I, I will wait for your questions. All right, Po. So... We now move on. Sir, how long have you been working in this specific field? Uh, I graduated from uh, a bachelor's degree in anthropology way back in 1980. Uh, and then I took up my master's and PhD degrees also in anthropology. So during that entire uh, period from my graduation at the bachelor's degree up to the present. So I, I have been doing field research among indigenous communities in the Philippines, most especially in the Cordillera region, so Ifugao and Kalinga, but also other parts of the Philippines. So my master's thesis was on the communist movement in the Cordillera region and my PhD dissertation was on uh, the politics of ethnic identity uh, with Kalinga as, as the case. So while I'm teaching anthropology at the University of the Philippines, uh, I also do uh, research uh, because in anthropology, we mainly, our main method of research is through participant observation. Therefore, I live among indigenous communities. Uh, wherever I am, I am assigned for specific projects or uh, depending on my uh, specific interests during that uh, time. So back to your question. So basically, most of my life is uh, dedicated to doing research among indigenous communities in the Philippines. All right, sir. So uh, what encouraged you po, or influenced you to work in this field? Ah, okay. <laughs> so... I don't know what you mean by field. First of all, why I took up anthropology. So it goes back to grade six in at the elementary level. Because in my school in Pasig, this is Pasig Catholic College, uh, when I was at grade five and six, the school was being renovated. And one of my classmates was able to pick up a round metal uh, thing uh, among the debris. And I asked for it. He gave it to me. I cleaned it. And I noticed what is written there is Ciudad de Manila, 1766. So because of that, I became very much interested in archaeology. I said, when I go to college, I will take up archaeology. But when I applied in UP, uh, much, much later on, I found out that archaeology is just one of the uh, branches of anthropology. So, uh, and during that period, so I was in college from 1976 to 80. You were not yet born then. Uh, 
a pressing issue of national concern during that time was the const planned construction of the Chico River Hydro Basin Project in Kalinga and Mountain Province. This is a project where four hydroelectric dams are planned to be built, two in Kalinga and two in Mountain Province, which will displace 100,000 indigenous people, both Kalinga and Bontok. So because of that, uh, I and members of the Anthropology Society of UP became interested in the plight of indigenous people, particularly against the dam during that time. So also, uh, because of my training in anthropology, so we have a, a summer field school where students are required to be uh, de deployed to a particular village. Uh, in 1979, that was when I was in third year college, we were uh, assigned to Mangkayan Benguet. So that is for a whole month doing archaeology and cultural anthropology. So practically, since my college days, I became exposed to IP issues already. And I have maintained that interest up to the present. All right, sir. Uh, thank you very much for giving us an overview of what exactly encouraged you to work in the field of uh, the indigenous peoples, particularly. And moving on to our very topic, uh, the Chico River Pump and Pump Irrigation Project and the Kaliwa Dam. Sir, how familiar are you about these two hydropower infrastructures? Um, I am more familiar with the Kaliwa Dam project. Of course, I have some knowledge also about the Chico River Irrigation Project. Uh, let me start with Kaliwa Dam. Uh, so the uh, my knowledge about Kaliwa Dam is because uh, aside from teaching, I am also engaged by the Environmental Management Bureau of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, so that is EMB, DNR, as a social impact assessment reviewer. So the background is, once there are projects that are intended to be built, uh, the DNR uh, reviews these projects, whether they will have significant impacts on the environment, both the physical and natural environment, as well as the social environment. So that if there are adverse impacts, these impacts will have to be addressed by the project proponent. So the DNR uh, selects uh, experts from various fields to be members of this uh, Environmental Impact Assessment Review Committee or EIARC. So the EIARC is composed of geologists, chemists, uh, experts on water, on flora and fauna, as well as social scientists such as anthropologists and sociologists. It is up to the DNR to assign uh, where an expert will be tapped to review. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, I was assigned, among the many projects, I was assigned to review the Kaliwa Dam project, looking at its social impacts. <clears throat> so this means I would have to read the document submitted by uh, MWSS because MWSS is the project proponent. Uh, then 
uh, we have to comment on that document. What are the gaps? What data they still need to submit? Uh, and then have a meeting. And we are entitled to a maximum of three meetings to review that project. Aside from attending these meetings, we have the option uh, to attend as EIA review committee members, the public hearings to be conducted in the field. So there were public hearings in, the one that I attended was in General Dakar in Quezon. So there were uh, Dumagats and Remontados who attended that project. I was not able to attend uh, other uh, public hearings. I think there were two other ones, one in Tanay, for example, because of conflict of schedule. So uh, this is where I know about the situation based on the material that the MWSS submitted to, to us for review, based on what I have observed when attending the public hearing, based on my uh, interaction with uh, the a member of MWSS. Uh, so I, I have to ask them about details. Uh, based on uh, feedback to me by uh, oppositionists opposing the Kaliwadam project. So, so I, I, I would say I'm very knowledgeable about uh, this project because of my capacity as AIA reviewer. Uh, so, so that's it. That's, that's my knowledge about this project. Now with Kaliwa Dam, ah, sorry, with the, the Chico River Irrigation Project, uh, I have seen it because I go to Kalinga every now and then. It is located in Tabuk, uh, in the capital of Kalinga. However, I was never uh, tapped to review this project. And I would like to mention that it differs from the Chico River Hydro Basin project, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, the Chico River Hydro Basin project entails the construction of four uh, hydroelectric dams. Uh, so they are mega dams and they are mainly for electric power. While the Chico irrigation project now is mainly for irrigation. So it's much a smaller scale than the one that I mentioned that was supposed to be built way back in the 1970s. So my knowledge about that project is mainly because of uh, physical observation. I I've, I've visited it. I took selfies in that area and and not not because of of other things. All right, sir. So to clarify, po, the Chico River Hydro Basin project was never uh built. Po, hindi po siya natuloy po si. Yes. Okay. Po. Because of that... the very strong opposition of Kalingas and Bon Talks during that time, and uh, you must take note that it was martial law during that time. So there was a military dictatorship. So there were a lot of protests in the area and. Many lives were lost. The main leader of uh, the Kalingas, this is uh, the chieftain Makli Dulag, he was even killed, uh, during, assassinated during that time. Now, when the EDSA People Power Revolution occurred in 1986, and then uh, Corazon Aquino took over as the new president of the country, her first pronouncement was, to cancel the Chico Dam project. So it was canceled. Secondly, the main funder supposed to be of the Chico Dam project, so I'm shortening it to dam project as opposed to the irrigation project, the main source of funds would have come from the International Monetary Fund, fund or IMF where the Philippines is a member 
of IMF and the Philippines would borrow a loan from uh, IMF to build that dam. Now, because of the controversies of the Chico Dam project, the IMF reviewed its policies and up to the present, the policy of IMF now is we will not go into big dam projects. We will never fund it because they are controversial and would have a lot of negative impacts. So that has been totally shelved. Now I hear some people are saying, ah, with the Chico Irrigation Project, uh, the old project has been revived, uh, uh, this time at a smaller scale. Uh, I'm not totally sure uh, because mainly because I don't have uh, wait. someone is calling and I have to turn it off. Okay. Now, I don't agree. Do you hear the ringing? Or is it just me? Ah, you don't hear it. No, so sir, it won't bother. It. Okay, you won't bother. Yes. You won't be bothered. Okay, so um uh the main difference is the Chico Dam project is for hydroelectric power. The Chico irrigation project is mainly uh to irrigate rice fields and uh, this one is a project of the National Irrigation Authority. Personal opinion, of course, irrigation is very welcome because uh, this is meant to uh, for, for our farmers to produce more crops. Now, however, I don't know about the impacts because I have not looked into it. And of course, it's it's a much a smaller scale. And uh, I could see it right now. So it's in existence. Unlike the Kaliwa Dam, which up to now is still being constructed. So uh, there is still a room for the Kaliwa Dam to be uh, stopped. Unlike the, the Chico Irrigation Project, which is already there. It doesn't mean that uh, we don't have to correct uh, negative impacts of the Chico irrigation project, but uh, but it's already there. Right, sir. So from our physical observation, po, do you think that maybe there could be some effects or wala po talaga kayong nakita so far na possible na effect po nung pagkakonstruct po? Okay. Um. So, as social impact assessment reviewer, I only look at social and cultural impacts. I don't know, and I am not in a position to answer about impacts on, uh, the air, on water, on the terrain, on the species of fish that are found in the Chico River. So that I don't know. But with regards to the social impacts, right now, uh, I don't see any from an outsider's point of view uh, because it's already there. But I don't know if they have bought the land from the indigenous people, how they acquired it, I don't know. But it's already in existence. That's why my impression is... Uh, it's there, so what else could we do? All right, sir. Thank you for giving us uh, your uh, background on the two projects. We will now move on to the policies and implementation. So I now give the floor to Sam okay. for uh, maybe, the next topic. Maybe because before going there, with regards okay. to the Kaliwa Dam project, I, I made an, a public position. As EIA reviewer, I did not endorse the project. So uh, I think there were five reviewers in the project. Some Their expertise will be different from mine. I am the only one looking at social impacts. And the review committee 
is supposed to endorse or not to endorse a project to the DNR secretary. But it is still the prerogative of the DNR secretary whether to, to sign off and uh, grant the project an environmental compliance certificate. So in the five members of the review committee, all the four other members, they endorsed the project. But for me, I did not endorse the project. I did not sign it. And I made the position paper that uh, uh, as to why I am not endorsing it. First, because uh, the indigenous people of uh, that area, mainly the Dumagat and the Ramontado, oppose that project. And that is their territory. It's an ancestral domain. And based on their uh, ancestral domain management plan, they say that we favor small dams, but we are against uh, big dams, such as the, the Kaliwa Dam project. And then a uh, third reason will be many of the sacred sites of the Dumagats will be inundated because of this project, such as uh, the Tinipak Cave, Tinipak Falls in Tanay. They will all be submerged. Uh, the burial grounds of the Dumagat will be uh, submerged. So my official position will be uh, to, uh, to oppose this project. That's it. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Sam, you may go ahead. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Good morning, po, Sir Castro. Morning. So, upon mentioning po the said Kaliwa Dam and Chico River project, we now move on to the questions regarding its policies and implementations. Now, the construction and implementation of these two projects po are in line with the former administration's Build, Build, Build program. And uh, according to many sources, it is said that before its actual construction, uh, the government and the locals, respective LGUs, and even construction companies have reached out to the indigenous peoples. Even so, ha agreements have been created between both parties. With this being said, po, sir, uh, are you aware po, of any existing agreements between the construction companies, project owners, and the government and ITs and uh, other NGOs? As I said a while ago, I am not familiar with uh, what happened, what transpired in the Chico irrigation project. So I am not uh, privy to any agreement that was reached concerning that project. With the Kaliwa Dam project, it's uh, very controversial because at first, uh, so uh, what our law says, this is uh, the IPRA, Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act. There should be a memorandum of agreement mm. between the indigenous people and the project proponent, which is MWSS, with the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples, NCIT, as third-party witness. So we were reviewing uh, that project in behalf of the DNR. But the NCIP process was taking a longer time. So we finished earlier. My colleagues endorsed the project. Uh, I opposed that project. But uh, in, in the endorsement, it says that uh, the project proponent, which is MWSS, should still go through the free and prior informed consent process of the NCIP. And uh, from my part, observing the FPIC process bef before it was finished, because we have an earlier uh, timetable, uh, there were so many violations because many communities were already saying, we oppose, we oppose, we oppose this project. Okay, So that's why I said, uh, no, I'm not endorsing this project. However, after that, uh, the MWSS still pursued 
uh, this FPIC process uh, through the help of NCIP. And according to their sources, now I'm not privy to it because my task as EIA reviewer is already finished, they have already secured an agreement they have already secured consent from indigenous people, which was very different from my earlier findings. Now, based on what I hear, uh, what MWSS has done is a system of divide and rule, mm -hmm. wherein uh, they have co-opted some of the Dumagats into accepting the project. Uh, I won't name one Dumagat Remontado leader that I personally know who is very corrupt. Okay. Uh, because she did this earlier uh, with an IMF World Bank uh, project, wherein they will oppose, oppose, but when they are paid, they will now accept the project. So uh, there are Dumagats that accepted it. And there are those who opposed it. So I think one adverse impact of this project is to put communities against each other. In the past, these were peaceful communities uh, uh, working together. But now, because of certain projects such as the Kaliwadam, and there are many other projects in the Philippines, because of these projects, uh, the tendency is for people to become polarized, who are in favor and who are against. And now, members of the same community fighting one another. I don't have any statistics right now how many are really in favor and how many are against. What I hear from MWSS is, Oh, those who are against, they're very few already. Uh, so, uh, but but for me, uh, personally, this is this should not be a battle of uh, who who are the majority and who are the minority. Because once you build a mega dam project, you cannot uh, uh, undo it anymore. For example inundation of sacred sites. You cannot relocate a cave in another place, relocate it in Bulacan, and then let the Dumagats go there to worship that cave. Uh, it's very artificial. So we cannot undo it anymore. So, uh, so I think what uh, some people in government are doing is Yes, on paper, it looks good. But in terms of implementation, there are many shortcuts. There is a lot of corruption uh, for, for projects to continue despite opposition by people. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, you said po that there are certain... Uh, drawbacks to the construction of the dams, you know, negative effects. However, po, as uh, with your experience and profession as an EIA uh, reviewer, do you think po that are there any benefits po ba to this? Are there positive effects that the IPs, the community, should get from the construction of the dams? Actually, the main benefit will not be the IPs. The main reason for the construction of the dam is because there's a scarcity of water in Metro Manila. Uh, there's a water crisis in Metro Manila. So we have to impound water, create a big rest so that the water uh, can be brought to Metro Manila for their drinking water. Remember, this is MWSS. So this is not an irrigation project. This is for drinking water. So what... What is the benefit to IPs with that? Uh, none, zero, because for the IPs, they have their springs where they could source their water. Now, in terms of, uh, of course, the MWSS will say, 
but we will relocate them, give them uh, better lands where they could work on, uh, give them uh, compensation, give them uh, funds. Uh, they don't understand indigenous people's culture, that IP culture is very much attached to the land where they belong. That's why we call it ancestral domain. This is the land of our ancestors. Land of ancestors cannot be transferred to other areas because uh, it's already, you have no attachment anymore to the new area where you are relocated. They are not squatters that you can just transfer to another area. So I think uh, the benefits to IPs are more... Uh, surface benefits but don't address the main uh, needs of indigenous people uh, specifically to magats and remontados in the area thank you sir okay, next po uh are the current policies such as the fpic and rtra are they enough po but to prevent any of the development aggression in the implementation of the projects no a uh, quick answer, no. Of course, on paper, the APRA is very good. Okay. Uh, however, as to how it is implemented, there are, there are a lot of loopholes. Uh, first, you create a super body known as the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples. This is a government body, which becomes a gatekeeper of the IPs. In the past, if there is a project, you go directly to the IPs and you consult them, you work with them. But now you have a gatekeeper that says, oh, this is good for the IPs. Oh, this is not good for the IPs. And remember, the members of the NCIP don't belong to those indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. There is not one single Dumagat or Remontado in the NCIP Commission. Yes, there are Igorots. Yes, there are uh, from Lumad, Mindanao. But they're not familiar with the culture of the Dumagats and Remontados. So they are government bureaucrats as well. Now, based on uh, some projects, especially in Mindanao, uh, IPs have accused the NCIP uh, as being not tribal leaders but tribal dealers. That means they collect money to approve projects. So there is this accusation. Well, I know you won't be surprised because this happens in any government agency. Corruption is well entrenched in Philippine society, no matter how good our laws are. Okay, so there's this uh, uh, gap between very good laws and policies and how it is actually being implemented. So. So again, going back to my answer, I think it's not enough. Uh, there should be other uh, ways that should be instituted uh, to address such gaps. Thank you, sir. Okay, so for the last question for this part, uh, from an expert point of view, what policy recommendation can you suggest to be implemented since po na uh, na banggit na the Kaliwa Dam is currently being constructed and the Chico River is uh, tapos na po siya. Are there any recommendations po ba to implement it? Okay. Um, at very early on, when I think around 1998, uh, because uh, probably nine. I'm looking at my books here. Anyway, the IPRA was way back 1997. It was in 1998 when the National Commission or NCIP was established. And, ah, now I remember. So I did a study three years of the implementation of IPRA. So this means in 2000, okay? 
So way back in 2000, I was already, uh, I wrote an, a published article uh, doing a critique about how IPRA is being implemented. I, I would admit that from 2000 up to the present, there have been improvements already. But uh, way back during that time, I was proposing there should not be one policy guidelines as to dealing with IPs in the Philippines because IPs in the Philippines would have different cultures. There are those who are nomadic, nomadic or semi-nomadic such as the Agta. There are those that are sedentary such as the Kalinga. There are those that are uh, uh, yung nagkakaingin, what we call Swedeners or shifting agriculturists. There are those such as the Bajau that are based on maritime uh, communities and they would have different cultures and therefore there should be a different set of policies for these different groups of people. You cannot apply a law that is applicable to the Cordillera to the Dumagat because they have a different set of values and beliefs. So that was what I was uh, proposing way back then. Do specific guidelines for different <clears throat> types of IP communities in the Philippines. Don't replicate just because of... Uh, just because of experiences in other areas of the Philippines. So so that's one. Up to now, they have not done yet. Okay. Uh, there are commissioners in NCIP who think, ah, I am I am uh, an IP myself, and therefore would claim that I know all IP cultures, okay, which is not true. I remember on one occasion, I was listening to one project uh, and there was somebody from NCIP there. Uh, she is no longer connected with NCIP. Uh, she said, oh, your project, one of the one of the projects you should do to help the IPs was to establish a tribal hall. That was her proposal coming from NCIP. Then I, I contradicted her. I said, why build a tribal hall? She said, but all IPs have a tribal hall where they could meet. I said, no, these communities, I think, uh, I don't remember now the IP community, they are semi-nomadic. So why will you build a hall in a specific area when they move about? Maybe a portable hall will be will be better. So then then she she withdrew uh, her suggestion. So it means they only think about uh, IP policies based on their very specific experiences and not looking at uh, different experiences of various IP communities in the Philippines. So so that's. Uh, that's one of my recommendations. Uh, secondly, I think IPRA is good, but the last portion of IPRA talks about the formation of the NCIP. I think they should be two separate laws. IPRA is a code of uh, IP rights, which is good. But the establishment of the NCIP is quite problematic. You add another bureaucratic layer. I know one experience, for example, among the AITA of Bataan. They went to the DSWD office in Bataan. And they were requesting for funds from the DS DSWD because they're a marginalized group. And marginalized groups are a mandate of the DSWD. But the answer of the DSWD is, uh, don't you have your own government? 
that is NCIP, you should go to NCIP, not us. You see, it established a bureaucracy. In the past, IPs could link up with any government agency, but now they have to go through the NCIP first. Now, go looking at my own experience in the university, we have students doing theses and dissertations. And many of them, among anthropology students, they would like to do ethnographic research among IP communities. Okay. But the law says you have to pass through NCIP to secure free and prior informed consent. Now, when they go to NCIP and the NCIP facilitates the process, they would be my students will be required by by IP communities through facilitation by NCIP. Okay, we will allow you to do your thesis or dissertation research in our community, provided that you uh, pay us for the establishment of a basketball court. You establish a multi-purpose court in our village. So my students would go back to me and say, Sir, I don't want to research on IP communities anymore because it's very hard. I would rather research on non-IP communities because I am not required of all of these funds. So what happens is because of this bureaucracy, uh, it's it's not a step forward, but a, but a step backwards. So... Uh, there is uh, a tendency by people in NCIP to look at research, especially academic research, as equivalent to a research by a big mining company, a big hydro project. But students don't have those, those funds. So why require them? So uh, I don't know how you could address it. My opinion is do away with this bureaucratic layer, but some sympathetic people in NCIP would say, ah, maybe we could do some uh, administrative orders saying that for academic research, it would be another thing. That's also possible. But, but at the back, it's because the NCIP thinks that they are the government of IPs and therefore... Uh, they they decide on everything that IPs want and need. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, so for the next part of this interview, uh, I give the floor to Claudia. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. Now we move on to the social, social economic environmental concerns. So, like you mentioned earlier, and upon doing our thesis RRL, sources from media and public art, uh, published articles have already painted a narrative that due, process, due procedures and processes are not met, and there are procedural lapses caused. So, for, for this set of questions, what we would like to know more about its effects on sociocultural, economic, and environment itself. Okay. So uh, let me... is, are there any precautions? Okay, so uh, uh, please repeat your, your last question. Uh, so are there, are there any precautions that need to be met before and during uh, conducting the construction and dam operations? Uh, I'm sorry because uh, there are some words that I could not hear. It was choppy. Are there any... Are there any precautions that should be met before and during the construction of the dam and the operations itself? Uh, I I don't I don't know if uh, I understood the question correctly, but uh, of course uh, I could not talk about uh, adverse environmental impacts. I'm not an expert on that, so my focus will be on social cultural impacts uh 
of course there are many uh, problems. Uh, one is the EIA process, Environmental Impact Assessment Review process, is under the auspices of DENR. Uh, because for DNR, they would say the environment consists of the physical environment and the social environment. However, once you raise questions about adverse impacts on society and culture, DNR will say, sorry, but that is not within our mandate because we are an environment office we only look at mountains rivers trees so they would say uh, okay we will jot down your issues and then we will refer them to to other agencies so that is uh, one of the problems so this is why some people in dnr will say let us remove the social and cultural part in the review process. And let us just focus on the physical and natural environment. I think that is a step backwards. <laughs> if Because people and land are intricately connected. So I firmly believe they should still pursue looking at social and cultural impacts. However, they should have their own... Uh, experts within DNR, not outsiders like me, but uh, assistant secretaries, undersecretaries, uh, department heads who are social scientists so that they could understand issues concerning uh, society and culture. So uh, this is one of the, the gaps that I think should should be addressed by uh, DNR. Uh, did I answer your question? Uh, po, in, uh, you gave us a new perspective po, about how DNR actually just focuses on the real environmental uh, state. So, so for then, po, what are the prominent sociocultural effects of development aggression to the indigenous peoples? Po? Of course, the term development aggression was coined by uh, the NGO community or civil society. Uh, I don't use that term because, uh, uh, of course, I should be neutral uh, as somebody who works in government as well. Because you should remember, UP is also a government uh, institution. Secondly, I am... Uh, tapped by DNR, which is a government body. But if we say development aggression, we already assume that uh, these projects uh, are negative, uh, will have bad uh, uh, impacts on indigenous peoples. I would like to uh, open my mind by uh, saying that Okay, uh, I look at these projects, I review them, and then I decide whether I think uh, it, uh, it violates indigenous people's rights. Okay, but I understand your question about development aggression. Okay. So the, the only reason why I'm stepping backwards is because uh, I might, might be misconstrued as somebody who is already... Uh, uh, opposing any type of big projects on IP communities. But I would like to state that I'm open to it because there are pros and cons. I understand that smaller projects will have smaller impacts. Big projects will have bigger impacts. I understand that. However, big projects by, for example, multinational corporations, so that means foreign-owned, they have more funds and therefore they have more funds to do good research, including researching on the potential impacts. While small companies owned by 
Filipinos or to be blunt about it, Chinese Filipinos, they do shortcuts. They would say, why do research? Let's, let's just pay officials. So there are pros and cons when, when we say big project, small project. Okay, That's why I will be more neutral. Okay, uh, Look at these projects per se and then assess whether they have uh, beneficial uh, elements or whether it's totally uh, problematic to indigenous people. So, so that's that's my position. Uh, uh, I just clarified my position, but I didn't really answer your question. Your answer, your question was, uh, on uh, please repeat your question on development aggression. I don't, I don't hear you. You're on mute. I'm sorry, okay. I'm sorry. Apologies. So, um, my question was the prominent social cultural effects on of development aggression. Okay, and uh, uh, now I remember. So of course, uh, the premise of the concept of development aggression is, uh, these uh big projects, whether they are mining projects, agroforestry projects, uh. Hydro dam project. Uh, basically, they are intrusive projects and extractive. Uh, that means they collect natural resources from ancestral domain areas. And they are imposed upon these communities. People could not do anything because it's already been decided by government. The government will say, ah, oh, but, but we are the state. We have the prerogative to decide what type of projects should be implemented in the country. And uh, for example, during the time of Duterte, they would say, ah, oh, but the Kaliwa Dam is a flagship project of the Duterte government. Uh, they, they said that. So my 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 reaction was if it's a flagship project then it's already a go for government why are you still requiring us to review it are you do you want us to be just a rubber stamp uh you already approved it but you want our signatures that's unfair so i said you could you could just waive the EIA process, Duterte just signs the project and let it go without any review. And anyway, the, the, the blame will be on President Duterte, not on us. Uh, he has the prerogative by law to do that. So this is the premise of development aggression is that uh, because we are the state, we decide what is good for the Filipinos and uh, you, you cannot do anything. You could just do small corrections here and there. Okay. And uh, there it is called aggression because it is imposed. Uh, and people fight these projects, literally fighting these projects. And in the process, there is militarization. The military comes in to protect these projects and the IPs are being blamed as being rebels and subversives. If the NPA comes in to help the IPs, then the situation becomes more complex because the people are caught in between. Uh, and the IPs, of course, when the NPA comes in, they provide them with food, because they're very helpful, but the military will say, ah, so you're rebel sympathizers. So yun yung problema ng uh, concept ng development aggression. So there are some NGOs that would advocate for, let us look for more uh, sustainable projects instead of big projects. For example, instead of uh, big hydro dams, let us do many small dams. Uh, 
instead of big ones that that would have more negative impacts so that is one alternative model uh instead of getting water from uh by building a big dam such as Kaliwad dam why not tap rainwater we have a lot of floods but we cannot we don't have drinking water uh we have water in laguna lake we could treat that water and turn it into drinking water uh and the the communities around laguna lake they are constantly flooded but of course mwss or the government will say but that's very expensive treating uh water this is cheaper uh building a dam in a reservoir so if we're looking at sustainability what is more sustainable a dam has a lifespan it's a maximum of 25 years after that it's uh no longer that's why we build more and more it's no longer uh enough the same is true with road projects they are short term solutions but we know what we really need are mass transportation so NGOs, members of civil society, would encourage uh, sustainable projects instead of these big uh, dam projects and other big projects, which are also a source of corruption. Remember, Kaliwa Dam, for example, where will the money come from? It's from China. It's a loan. It's not for free. And we have to pay China. And what is in the agreement, which the government doesn't show the public? If we cannot pay, China will confiscate government assets. And this is what happened to uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka became totally indebted to China that uh, China took over some of the ports of Sri Lanka. Ah, this is now Chinese territory because you're unable to pay. So do we want that to happen? So uh, this is the problem of uh, development aggression. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for sharing your knowledge with, uh, with us. Now I am giving the floor to Chelsea to further our discussion. All right, thank you, Klaus. Sir, uh, once again, it's me, Chelsea. So we move on to the indigenous peoples themselves. Uh, our study highlights the contradiction of uh, development that the projects are being constructed for development. However, it is also at the expense of the IP's development and the resilience of their values and their traditions. With that said, po, what are the most significant social cultural values na patuloy na pinapractice po ng indigenous people? Okay, that's a good uh, question. Uh, because uh, for non-IPs, they look at IPs as, ah, they're very primitive, they live in the past, they are suspicious, uh, superstitious, and they have no place in modern society. However, we should understand that the culture of IPs is basically our culture before we were colonized. So they reflect Filipino identity. Uh, and uh, for, for, for example, uh, the the old name of Batanga Batangas is Batangan, and of course, uh, in Mindoro, just across, there would be a group of uh, Mangyans who call themselves uh, Batangan, because practically, the culture of Mindoro and Batangas prior to Spanish colonization was was very uh, similar. So, uh, we have changed. Because we have adopted so many, uh, so many uh, 
cultural practices from our colonizers. Some of them good. I, I would admit such education, uh, having a national government, but others are quite uh, uh, problematic, are attuned to our own uh, identity. So if we would want to reflect on our what makes us Filipino, what is our identity, then we should look at uh, IP culture. Okay, now going to IP culture. So what is IP culture? There are certain values among IPs that I believe are quite uh, uh, valuable to Philippine society than many of the practices that we do. Okay, let me give an exact, uh, a specific example. Among the Aita of Sambales, I have a colleague uh, who is an anthropologist who did field work among the Aita way back in the 1970s. So this was a very old experience, but it is still very important to share it. She joined an Aita group trekking around uh, Sambales, the Pinatubo area during that time. So the Aita, from an outsider's point of view, okay, uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, talk about that later. While they were trekking along uh, the trail, they passed by uh, several guava trees. And the leader of the Aita said, okay, let us stop here for a while and take a rest because we will still walk for, for a long time. Uh, several kilometers more. And while they were resting, they uh, picked up some of the guava fruits to have a snack and take some guavas that they could bring along the way. So this anthropologist, she noticed there were a lot of guava fruits. She took a lot of them and put it in her T-shirt wrapped it around her shirt. But she noticed the Aita, they were picking up only two or three pieces of guava fruits. So she asked the Aitas, why are you taking so little when there are so many fruits here? And the response that she got, but you know, ma'am, we are not the only ones passing this trail. There are other people who will pass along this trail. And they will eat these guava fruits as well. So she was so ashamed she wanted to return the fruits that she took. But what does it show us? It shows to us the Aitas, we could say they're technologically backward. They just have bows and arrows. They wear bahag or g-string. But you cannot say that their value system is very primitive. It's even better than our very selfish value systems. So we can learn from them. I am not saying that Filipinos should go back to the past because that is impossible. But what can we learn from our IP's values that we can incorporate in the present? So these are the things that may disappear because of modernization, or what you call development aggression, we want to reflect on what we have as Filipinos and decide which ones, which cultural practices we should continue and even strengthen, and which ones we should discard. I admit that there are certain practices that are no longer practical. So we decide. So this is uh, the value of reflecting on IP culture. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, we also agree, I personally agree as well, too, sir, na yung IPs po, they are very sustainable in their ways. So we cannot exactly say na 
naiiwan po sila in terms of how they think, their culture, and their values. So, sir, moving on sa next question po. Can, ano po can, I, do yung... a follow, can I do a follow-up? Because you mentioned the term sustainable. Um, yes, one uh, American anthropologist, uh, he, uh, his name is Harold Conklin from Yale University. He did field work among the Hanunoo Mangyan of Mindoro. And that is what he's found out, that the system of agriculture among the Hanunoo Mangyan is very sustainable. So they also do kainin, just like Tagalog farmers or Visayan farmers. But their kainin is more sustainable. They don't cut the trees. They only prune it. Okay. Uh, then they don't do uh, monocropping. It's not just all planting to rice. But in the farms, they do multi-cropping. Rice together with other types of crops, which is more sustainable. In case there are certain pests that feed on certain crops, other crops will be protected. They plant their, uh, they, they cultivate their farms along the hillsides that are protected from the monsoon rains and the strong winds. Uh, in Batanes, the Ivatan, they, they have, uh, they prefer root crops instead of rice because we know if Batanes is along the typhoon belt, and uh, uh, rice or corn won't be sustainable. So they do plant uh, taro, yam, uh, purple yam, which is more sustainable to their practice. So, uh, yeah, I again, I agree with what you said about sustainability. Okay, so thank you po, for more information with regard sa sustainability po, sustainable practices po ng indigenous people. So, we now move on po sa next question po. Still, the social-cultural aspect of the study, ano po ba yung mga epekto ng construction ng hydropower infrastructures po na to? Mm -hmm. So, if it's a big project such as a big hydro uh, dam, whether for electricity or irrigation. So because of its scale, uh, number one impact is there will be more people that will be affected, unlike a smaller dam project. And how do you mitigate those impacts? Most of the impacts will be in terms of inundation of uh, lands. And for IPs, there are other types of land uh, classification. So for us lowlanders, ah, these are agricultural lands, these are residential lands. But for IPs, you will have to input uh, communal lands, lands that are not owned by individuals, but owned by the entire community. So therefore, if it is to be affected, then you should consult everyone and not just a single leader or his or her family. The other thing would be sacred grounds. So among the Kalinga, where I did my research, they would bury their dead underneath their houses. They don't have separate se cemeteries. But in other communities, yes, they would have uh, an area similar to our concept of cemeteries where their ancestors are buried. And uh, you cannot just take the bones away and transfer it because some of the, uh, the bones are no longer there. They have already disintegrated. But once you talk about ancestors, it's an entire line as far as the memory can go. For example, among the Ifugao, they would have oral genealogies of who was their first founder, who were the descendants, etc., etc. And if you're divorced from the land where they were buried, then there is something that, that is already not there. And 
the spirit world coexists with with the human world for example uh, again among the ifugao when they eat together in a family they would reserve food for the spirits now if the spirits are violated then they believe that uh they would inflict harm on 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 the population so these are adverse impacts that may be affected that may happen because of this big uh, hydro dam projects and other uh, mega projects. So these things have to be considered. Uh, unfortunately, many among our technocrats do not have any appreciation about uh, spirituality. They will say, oh, that superstition... Why, why bother about ancestral spirits? They don't have this belief, you know? Uh, let me connect this to, again, I just remembered it, to sustainability. For example, uh, many, many Filipinos also practice this, but don't realize anymore uh, what it meant or what its value is. For example, if you go out in the field or in the forest, to to urinate, di ba? Jijingle, you say tabi tabi po, ano? And many people don't uh they, they just say it out of tradition, okay? But in the past and among our IPs, we do that because we don't want to offend the spirits. So for example, if they go into the forests, they seek permission from the spirits. And they don't just cut the trees because there are spirits in the trees, in the crops, in the river, in the wind. So they, they are more environmentally friendly than us because they believe that everything in, in nature will have a spiritual component. So these are things that will be affected by these uh, projects. Uh, what other social... Ah, okay. One other impact would be relocation. They, uh, proponents of certain big projects will say, but we will relocate them anyway to a better community. This time, uh, cemented households with television sets, unlike their uh, makeshift houses. What... Uh, relocation plans do not take into account is there is a social fabric among IP communities. You live here because this is the house of your neighbor, this is the house of your co-community member, and there is a social network among you. If you transfer them to another area, the network is broken. You may live with somebody who you don't have any attachment to and later on you quarrel. Uh, or before there was a space between your houses, but now you live next to each other. Therefore, there is no concept anymore of personal space. So these impacts are usually neglected by those doing plans uh, because they take it for granted and they think about their own culture. Ah, bakit sa amin ganito naman ang practice? Bakit if there's a resettlement area in Metro Manila, this is how we do it. So many technocrats are not culturally sensitive. They don't understand IP culture. And this is the challenge. How to become culturally sensitive, how to become culturally aware about IP beliefs and practices. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, we understand that there are many impacts uh, when hydropower infrastructures are constructed, one of these being uh, in terms of the spirituality and connection with the environment, as well as yung social network po ng IPs, yung pagsasama-sama ng indigenous communities. 
uh, moving on, sir, aside from everything that you have shared so far, are there any other information that you think is important to be shared to the community regarding uh, development aggression? Okay. Uh, first, let me add about, you mentioned about uh, uh, impact on, for, for example, for hydro power projects, hydro dam projects. So what will be mainly affected will be the river. So we should do uh, studies about how these rivers and streams and water bodies are used by the IPs. Usually for outsiders, they just look at impacts on rivers in terms of uh, what are the fish that are there. And because of this dam, maybe they won't have access to fishing anymore. Uh, so what else? They, they, they neglect other cultural practices related to the use of the river. In many IP communities, the river is also uh, equivalent to our road networks. Tayo may mga karsada and our communities are connected by roads. But among IPs, they have boats upstream, downstream, and this is what connects one community to another. With the dam, you cannot cross that dam anymore. Okay. Uh, third, are there rituals that are done in the dam in the not in the dam, in the river that we don't know? I'm not saying that there are. Uh, uh, but but Probably there there are. So these are the things that should be looked into. Like, uh, do they uh, do they uh, leave the dead on boats and allow them to float? Or do they have ritual cleansing where they bathe in the river? So yung mga ganun, uh, dapat pag-aralan. So make your mind broader to understand what are the other possibilities in an IP culture. So uh, that is just to, to add another dimension. Uh, okay, other things that I would like to say, specifically for IPs. I mentioned that there should be cultural sensitivity among development planners. They should understand IP sensitivities first before undertaking any project. However, I think uh, cultural awareness and sensitivity should work both ways. IPs should also understand corporate culture. And there's a big gap. They don't understand why many companies are in a hurry. They would say, you have to decide now because... Uh, project construction starts next year. And for IPs, they don't understand that because they have the leisure of uh, dialoguing with each other member of the community. And it may take for a long and long time because their system of decision-making is consensual. If everybody agrees, then they pursue the project. If one individual disagrees, then they shelve that project. But these are two different worlds. Now for IPs, they should also understand the culture of the corporate world. Not so that they could be subsumed by that culture, but because uh, they could understand now why others or outsiders think the way they do. <clears throat> So it should be a two-way process and there should be uh, an interface. There should be a uh, compromise between two different cultural practices, the culture of IPs and the culture of uh, the corporate world. Now, uh, this is where anthropology comes in. Uh, uh, anthropologists, one of their role is to become culture brokers. So we, we, we provide that space where different cultures 
come together. Usually, it's a clash between two cultures. But it doesn't always have to be a clash. There could be understanding between two different cultures. And there are some good practices. I could mention good practices. Uh, I was involved in one project in Kalinga. This is a project of Chevron. And this is a geothermal project. So they will tap the hot water underneath the ground to produce electricity or geothermal energy. So I was tapped by Chevron a long, long time ago when it, it was doing a project in Kalinga. So I gave them uh, inputs about Kalinga culture, how to understand them, how to be sensi sensitive, how to be respectful about their culture. Uh, they did several consultations in Southern Kalinga where the project is to be lo located. They spent so many money for these consultations, but they took their time. After several years, the, the Kalinga community said, uh, sorry, we cannot accept your project. We think it's a good project. However, there are certain things that uh, will be negative to us. Because in, in one village, this is the village of Dananao, where the project will be built, the people of Dananao agreed to the project. But the neighboring communities, Tulgao, Sumadel, they said, no, we don't want that project. Even if the geothermal project won't be established in their communities. But eventually, the people of Dananao said, it's a good project. However, we don't want to sacrifice our relationship with Tulgao and Sumadel. We don't want to fight with them. We would value harmony more than economic benefits. So they rejected the project. And what did Chevron say after three or more years of consultation, Chevron said, thank you for your patience. Thank you for uh, listening to us. We, we will respect your decision. We will move to Indonesia where we will relocate our project. And once you change your mind, we will come back to the Philippines. So these are good projects. And I'm proud of it because I'm... I I was uh, a con consultant of Chevron. We did not insist on the project. We respected people's decision. Of course, many in the government will say, "Sayang lumipat sa Indonesia, dapat Pilipinas ang nagbenefit." But for this company, respect to IPs is very important. All right, thank you, sir, for also sharing with us a personal experience and nakita po natin na, of course, there are also some corporations na nire-respeto pa rin po ang culture ng IPs and actually taking the time to build rapport with the 